music can be incredibly universal. In the Sufi world, they talk about polishing the mirror of your soul and that there's something transparent that is so directly connected from your, your own heartbeat to somebody else's heartbeat. And I know that as a performer, as an artist, I'm constantly working towards that end. Am I just being a technician and singing a song, or am I going across that barrier to a place which is where you're so much closer to someone else's soul? And for me, that's that's a central part of what I try to do. You're listening to The Ghoul Standard, Episode 41, Lorena McKennett, The Explorer. Hello, everybody. I'm Brian Levine, and welcome to The Gould Standard, a podcast brought to you by the Glenn Gould Foundation. And we're here once again bringing you conversations with some of the most remarkable people from all across the world of the arts. If music, novels, poetry, film, visual art, theater, and multimedia creations are what turn your frown upside down and direct your feet to the sunny side of the street, well then, you've come to the right place, my friends. But first, while you're stopping by under our fantastically flickering neon piano sign, please do take a moment to press like, share, and subscribe. And if you just so happen to be listening on Apple Podcasts, please leave your reviews, pose your questions, and be part of our community of friends and supporters. While you're at it, be sure to check out our past podcast episodes featuring a cavalcade of luminaries, stars, and fascinating folks, as well as our special Glenn Gould at 90 episodes. And to get more splendiferous sounds, winsome words, and engrossing images, we'd love to have you pay us a visit at our website, glenngould.ca. When you're there, if you're seized with an irresistible impulse to click the donate button and support the charitable work at the Glenn Gould Foundation, well, we'd be proud and honored to have you as a supporter. Today, we are lucky to have with us a musician who in every sense of the world is a self-realized artist. Starting off in a small town in Manitoba, she has risen to become one of the most original and identifiable musical voices ever to come from Canada. I'm speaking of Lorena McKennett, a musician who is sometimes classified as a Celtic musician, a folk musician, a New Age artist, or a leading figure in the world music movement. But in point of fact, she is all of those things and none because her art is something completely original and self-created, with her fusion of music and verses, travel, research, literary sources, and channeling of an immense diversity of cultural traditions. Along the way, she has become an international touring sensation and has meticulously crafted self-produced albums, 17 of them, in fact, many of them live recordings, and each one of them a breathtaking original musical statement, which collectively have sold over 14 million copies worldwide. We're absolutely thrilled and delighted to have had Lorena join us as a juror for the 14th Glenn Gould Prize, where she took part in selecting Gustavo Dudamel as our newest laureate, and we're equally happy to have Lorena joining us today. Lorena, thanks so much for being with us. It's a great pleasure. Lorena, there's a word that I've already used a few times, and I think I'm going to be using it quite a few more throughout the conversation, and that's self because you have maintained such artistic control over your career path and your work. You're self-produced, self-managed. You've created your own record label all by yourself, Quinlan Road. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, you're involved in the design and presentation of your album art. In fact, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that you are self-invented. Where did this, uh, where did this independence and this, this self-reliance, there, I said it again, where did that come from? 
Well, I think it actually comes from my rural roots in uh, southern Manitoba, where I grew up, particularly connected to a farming community. And there's a lot of self-sustainability that in the mindset of, of rural people, I think. And it, it seemed like the opening uh, spot that I would begin my, my professional journey. You know, when it comes to management, managing my own affairs, I often say to people, in actual fact, I'm probably unmanageable. <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, no, I think the self-sufficiency comes a lot from those rural roots. Mm -hmm. Well, a, a friend of mine used to say, if you can find one in the big city, always hire someone who came from a farm because they understand that if you don't do the chores, something dies. So... <laughs> 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 yeah, you just have to take take responsibility. So actually, while we're there, let's take us back to your beginnings as a young person in Morden, Manitoba. What was it like there? And did you always feel you were destined to pursue a life in music? No, I didn't feel uh, destined to pursue a life in music. I um, it, it was quite a when I look back now and I see the composition of the small town of Morden, Manitoba, with about thirty five hundred souls. It was quite bucolic in many ways. You know, I think of the early mornings and hearing the milkman come up the steps and put the tinkle of the bottles on the step, uh, going to bed at eight o'clock, listening to the robins and thinking, oh, how unjust it is to go to bed before it's dark out. Um, a community that was really quite connected, very, very rich with music. There was music really everywhere all the time. Uh, I think this was largely as a result of the German slash German Mennonite component that was uh, and still is in Morden. So there were music festivals, there were variety nights, there were operettas, there was music, of course, in all the 13 churches in the small community. So there's music all the time. And although my family was not uh, very musical, I was extremely fortunate to have two music teachers who in themselves were exceptional to find in a community of that size at that time. They had incredible imagination. So, for example, Olga Friesen, who was my piano teacher and also the conductor of the children's choir that I belonged to from the age of five, when she and my what the man I would come to know as my grade 10 English teacher, they would write an operetta, and they brought somebody from the Royal Winnipeg Ballet in Winnipeg to come and do the choreography. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Not just a little bit of ambition. Well, there's, there, I always say there's nothing you can't do if you're prepared to reach high enough. <laughs> but I, I also understand that you originally thought that you would become a veterinarian. Was that right? Yes. I mean, I think that's not an uncommon kind of aspiration for young people, young girls living close to uh, livestock and, and the farm. And so when you, you become introduced to these little animals and they're pretty cuddly and pretty cute and, and you think, oh, that's, that's, I want to spend the rest of my life with them. I mean, I still have a, a, a deep love for, for animals and, and the natural world. I thought that if I didn't go into veterinarian studies, I'd actually go over to forestry or wildlife conservation. Mm -hmm. And it was at the threshold of that decision that I was actually invited to move to Stratford and work at the Stratford Festival in 1981. By that time, were you thinking musically? Was uh, that kind of the direction you were going? Or were you, were you uh, still kind of uh, agronomically or agriculturally oriented? Uh, I, slowly, 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 I became drawn into the music world, like on a in a professional capacity. I took my grade 12 at a private girls school in Winnipeg called Balmoral Hall. So that got my foot into the urban center of Winnipeg. And of course, Winnipeg is such a rich uh, city of all kinds of artistic expressions. And by that time I had bought a, a guitar and taught myself to play it upside down and backwards. <laughs> and I started singing in some folk clubs in Winnipeg, then encountered some people that were, um, into the Celtic music. And once I heard that, I was very smitten by it. And, and indeed, I, it was Tipidolic from the Winnipeg Folk Festival that also gave me my first uh, professional, real professional opportunity, which when I think back of where I was at, this was pre-heart and pre-Celtic. This was still with the guitar. So it was, it was in, invitation by invitation uh, that I was following something rather than pursuing something. And the, the Celtic music that you heard first, they, would those have been like the early Chieftains records or the Bothy Band? You know, who are the, who are the people who... Yeah, the Chieftains, Bothy Band, Planksty, Still Eyed Span, 
a wonderful harper from the Brittany region of France called Alain Stevel. Oh, yeah, I know him well. Beautiful. A stunning, absolutely stunning. A really, a really inspirational for me because I could hear that although he was performing this, some of this traditional Breton repertoire, it, there's still involved a, a kit of drums with the harp and the pipes and cello and this real mixture of folk, rock and classical instruments. And I thought, wow, if he could do that, maybe I could. <laughs> yeah. You started with the piano. When did the, the Celtic harp enter the picture just in terms of, of playing? When, when did you get your first harp? Well, I bought my first harp quite by chance when I was in London, England in 1982, I guess it was. I was in Hampstead and there was a wonderful antique instrument shop on Pond Street just across from the Royal Free Hospital. And the owner had, was in the window was this troubadour harp from Lion Healy in Chicago. Not that it was an antique instrument. I came to learn some, a friend of his had given it to him and just asked him to sell it if he could. So I saw it there and, and I, I scratched up enough money to buy it and then bring it back to Canada. Uh, so it was um, a used uh, Lion and Healy troubadour harp. Mm -hmm. that now is retired in my living room like a racehorse. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, how great a transition was it from, I mean, it's a, you know, kind of a different technique. It's lots and lots of tuning, you know, lots and lots of time spent keeping it in tune. Um, well, the great thing about the, I found with the troubadour harps, which essentially are, are like a student in instrument for people who are aspiring to play a classical harp, that it's it's a bit like a Heinzmann piano. It really is a sturdy workhorse of a, of a of an instrument. It can take a lot of moving, and it's not very unstable. It's quite a stable instrument. But having said that, I did uh, try to take a few lessons from someone in Toronto uh, at the Remini House of Music, but it was tricky for me to go to Toronto for regular lessons and so on. I ended up teaching myself, and to be honest, uh, and this is not being modest, I'm not a very good uh, harpist at all. In fact, if you were to set me next to someone who's properly trained, I think anyone would notice the difference. I learned enough to play it well enough to accompany myself singing. Um, but uh, I wish I had learned to play it properly. And it's a bit like typing with two fingers. Right, right. There are a lot of multi-instrumentalists who will frankly admit that they're not a virtuoso on any one of them, but they, they get to a level of proficiency that it makes it work for their needs. Yes, yes. And I think that's what I found, that I was so, I, I wanted to go beyond the personality of the piano and what it implied and go into another instrument that just had a, a completely different uh, evocative uh, response. The harp is also very forgiving. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's the accordion, which, uh, you know, I, right. <laughs> uh, of which there are so many different varieties that, um, you know, how did you, how did you end up settling um, on that as a, as another instrument for your compliment? Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because I remember as a child, in fact, I almost remember where I, when I was downstairs with my mother saying I really wanted to learn to play the the accordion, and she was mortified. <laughs> there was no way she was going to let me learn to play the accordion. <laughs> but, um, I mean, the accordions as a texture and a sound and as a voice certainly came into view once I got interested in the traditional music. As you say, it was such a wide range of variations from little... Uh, concertinas and squeeze boxes straight to different kinds of accordions, some that have, you know, French flavor, uh, Ukrainian flavor, uh, whatever it is. But I, I uh, so I acquired this relatively little uh, accordion to, uh, again, learn, learned it well enough to be able to impart that texture in, in the arrangements of whether it's the recordings or the performances that we play. You found your way to Stratford, and you were at the festival. In, in what capacity? As a musician or um, doing something else there? Well, I was invited to uh, be part of the chorus of HMS Pianoforte in 1981, which was at the Avon Theatre. Uh, the next year, John Hirsch asked me to sing the part of series in The Tempest, which he was directing. But also, I had done an acting uh, audition for them, and he asked me to under, uh, to study the understudy part for Portia in Julius Caesar hmm. and Raina in Arms and the Man and actually went on to do the, uh, the understudy for Portia 
in Julius Caesar, actually the night that Jack Medley literally got stabbed at Caesar. It was quite an eventful year. The next year I was asked to compose music for a one-man performance on William Blake that Douglas Campbell was performing. And the last year uh, in 1984, I was asked to compose and perform live music for uh, Two Gentlemen of Verona. And of course, Douglas Campbell ended up having a role in your first album, Elemental, uh, uh, from yes. that Blake Blake program. And I was just listening to it again the other night, and uh, what a uh, what an extraordinary voice, and what what a um, a resonance. Um, but let's let's talk about you know what made you take the jump into making your own record. It sounds like you were you know beginning to feel your way, but between understudying and and other things, you know, I could well have seen that being a decision that you left till a little later on when you, you know, toured a little bit more and, you know, had a little bit more uh, songwriting and, and, you know, just experience under your belt. Why did you take the plunge? Well, I think it was almost an involuntary act. Once I become infatuated with the traditional Celtic music, I just felt like I wanted to take a run at mm, performing or rendering my own versions of things. And when I was not asked back to work at the theater in 1985, I thought, well, this might be the juncture to just kind of jump in and do that. So I spoke with my parents who had, who had saved $10,000 for my veterinary <laughs> education, mm -hmm. supposedly, and, and said, could I use this money to make my first recording? Never having made a recording before. I don't recall any kind of oh my goodness, you know, you're not going to do that, or what do you think you're doing? They they actually advanced me the money. And wow. I went into this little studio uh, in Alora, Ontario. It was in a barn and recorded and mixed Elemental in one week. And then I asked the engineer if he knew of a place where I could run off cassettes. So he told me a place in Toronto, Dynapack it was. And I contacted them and they explained to me what I needed to bring in to run off 30 cassettes ran off 30 cassettes, gave about 15 of them away. And then I thought, what am I going to do with the rest of these? <laughs> so, I, so I reflected on the honorable practice of, of busking on the street. And starting about 1986, I would drive in from Stratford, my little Honda Civic, and crash on friend's couch on a Friday night so I could go to the St. Lawrence Market and find my very preferred spot in the vestibule of the South Marketplace and be there to start singing and selling my cassettes. And I, I busked uh, from then till about 1989 off and on. I loved it. I really enjoyed mm -hmm. meeting people. And it also gave me the confidence and some of the financial resources to go to to go on. Were you also then kind of walking into, you know, craft shops and places like that and saying, you know, would you take some of my cassettes? You know, you don't have to pay unless they sell and that sort of thing. I, I found myself striking up consignment deals with shops that at that time, there were a lot of shop owners who had, you know, cassette players and they were trying to establish a particular ambiance in their shop. And they like, you know, not some of them like the, the aesthetic that my music brought and uh, they played it and then they would contact me and say, you know, we have people asking if they could buy it. And then I'd set up accounts and so on. And this was particularly the case uh, with Sam, the record man. I remember being at home in the apartment at the back of this farmhouse on the north side of Stratford. And it was Kenny Slater from uh, Sam, the record man calling up. And he said, you know, we have people coming in here asking for your cassettes and would you be willing to leave some uh, with us on consignment? And I said, well, sh sure, but I'm not sure exactly how to price them. He said, well, come in the next time you're in Toronto and we'll go over it. So I did. The next Saturday I went busking and I went over to Sam the record man. He walked me through the drill. So I would leave him 10, 15, whatever. Soon it got to be a box of 30 and soon it got to be more. And then finally, a Roblin distributors, who were the distributor for the Sam the record man uh, shops across the country, said, you know, we'd like some for other places. And then finally, we were able to change the terms where they would just pay me on 30 days. Nice. So it was um, a very grassroots education. Well, you you became, I should have said, self-distributed as well until Roblin entered the picture. But also... Um... 
was it cassettes all the way or did you then go to vinyl or CDs? You know, when did, did, did you sort of make the, the format leap? We met the format leap in 1989. I remember that, that year we were touring on Parallel Dreams. In 1988, I'd actually been approached by Polygram to do an artist development project. They have put up, to, I think, $10,000 for me to go into the studio, record four tunes, and they would then see whether or not they wanted to sign me. So in the fall of 88, um, we did that exercise. I went to Montreal to meet the folks at Polygram in January. And after they had listened to the tape and they said, well, you know, we like what you're doing, but we're not actually sh quite sure what to do with it. So we're not going to sign you. And I said, no problem. I'm going to, I was going to release my third recording this year anyway. So I would like to buy back the tape, the, this, these tracks that we just recorded. And they looked at me and they said, they kind of smiled and said, okay, well, you go and speak to Maureen in the finance department down the hall. So I went down to the, down to Maureen finance department. I said, I'd like to buy back the tape. I can't afford $10,000 right now, but could I buy it back in installments, which she agreed to? So, uh, oh, in, in $2,000 increments, I bought that tape back and then went on to release Parallel Dreams in the fall of 89. And I'd also built a 30 tape date concert tour at that time. But there were clearly was a demand at that time also for CDs. And so we were, I went to the plant uh, in Quebec. I think Drummondville was the plant that I was working with and did the quality control and uh, went to the Bank of Montreal in Stratford and said, could I get a little loan just to bridge me over this all, because of all the money and the, the investment of the recording and now switching over to this format and so on. And they said, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I carried on and bit my teeth. And, and in fact, after that tour in the fall of 89, that was the last time I went back to the market in, in Toronto, even though we'd been touring in little halls. I went back there just so I could earn enough money to pay off all of that stuff. And that was it. So by 1990, you know, when the record companies had various reps, uh, they would be going into the shops and shooting the breeze with the shop owners or the, 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 the floor fo folks. And they were saying, well, what's happening? And clearly they would start to say, well, we're actually selling a fair number of these Lorena McKenna recordings or CDs and tapes. You might want to consider looking at her. So in 1990, there was a kind of record company scrum and it was really only the Warner Music Canada that was prepared to recognize that by this, by 1990, I developed the capacity not only well, to finance my recordings, to finance and run my own tours and develop a mailing list. And I was actually by that time making a pretty good living. I actually mm -hmm. didn't need a record company. So they recognized what I was able to bring to the table and we were able to strike a very unusual deal in the, in the record business here it's called the Lorraine McKenna Lee deal <laughs> <laughs> well yeah let's let uh, I want to talk about that but before we we move from those earliest days I just want to say and I I'm sure you won't remember it but I met you at Dynapack when you were in to pick up some cassettes probably around 1987 or 1988 yeah, I think probably, it was your yeah. third you gave me a copy of Elemental on a cassette and okay. I was thinking <laughs> Oh my goodness! I was actually looking for financing for my record label. We'd already started, and uh, but I was looking for some additional financing. And someone said the and I can't remember the name of the gentleman who owned Dynapack, but he was very nice and he spent about an hour with me. That didn't lead to anything, but he said I was talking about how our label was very interested in capturing live acoustics in a faithful way, and he said you should meet this. This young woman, she's incredible. She's recording in churches in Ireland. And, you know, she's got this right, great right. harp. And, you know, <laughs> and in fact, she's coming in to pick up a load of cassettes. You know, maybe we can run into her. And I, and she introduced us. So so I always remember that. And I may still have that that copy you gave me of, uh, of Elemental. Oh, goodness sake. Yeah. So I don't have a cassette player anymore, but I, I probably have the tape. The Yes, you developed a reputation, speaking about the Lorita McKenna deal, of being a very um, savvy and also very determined, I'm not going to say tough, but very determined negotiator when it came to, to your dealings with let's say larger entities like record companies and, you know, I'm going to guess, you know, companies that book tours and so on and so forth. I mean, I, I think I would like to say that I was, I was or am that smart or <laughs> experienced, but in actual fact, I was extraordinarily lucky to acquire a lawyer who, Graham Henderson, 
who was married to Margot Tumans from the Cowboy Junkies. And Graham was a very, very interesting and out-of-the-box kind of lawyer. And he, along with another uh, person who was not a lawyer but had a lot of business uh, experience from Winnipeg, they said, you know, you have to recognize that what you've done here in the, over the past five years from 85 to 90 is you've developed the financial capacity to finance your own recordings. So you don't have to go uh, to the bank of Warner or Sony or Universal or anybody to borrow that money. You've got that money. And you've also developed the capacity to finance your own tours. I mean, no other artist had come along that was had that cape. They, they had their artistic ability, mm -hmm. but they hadn't built this foundation. So that that demanded a different kind of negotiation. And I would say that the end product was much closer to a partnership than often is the case where an artist is one raw resource and a you know array of individuals and talents that go into making a recording. Effectively, you escaped the recoupment trap, uh, I'm guessing. Yeah, I call it the cross between a the loan shark business and a an average. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I, I think of it more as indentured servitude, but uh, it's uh, yes, okay, yeah, yeah, and uh, <laughs> it's very interesting. Now let, let's get away from the business side and the career trajectory and talk about about your musical evolution because it, it's really fascinating to chart the the growth of your personality. I mean, there are elements of the I would call the originality that is distinctively Lorena as far back as the first album. But from album to album, I sense, you know, a growing confidence, a growing exploratory impulse to, you know, add instruments from different traditions that aren't strictly, you know, what people associate with Kel. I mean, it's not all borons and, and uh, you know, penny whistles Fiddles, at that point. Yeah. yeah. Um, where did you start? I mean, was there a moment where you said, I would really like... A tabla, you know, or I would really like an oud, um, mm -hmm. you know, or I mean, that was really, I think, what in was some the ways, evolution? yeah, a breakthrough. Yeah, I mean, I think it was it was so much drawn from the history of the Celts. When I moved to Stratford, uh, again, still not sure whether it's in theater, music, or theater, or what, but I took um, a, a course of Irish history that dated back to 1800. And I could see how I could put some of the folk music in the context of uh, history and social things and politics and so on, and how that influenced some of the folk music. Then in 1991, I guess it was, that I, I attended an exhibition in Venice that was the most extensive exhibition ever assembled on the Celts, and from which there were a number of artifacts that came from the former Soviet Block countries that had never been seen or assembled before, and I, I realized you know through the catalog with the the, uh, the essays and the maps and all of this stuff, how I mean the Celts were this vast collection of tribes that had fanned out across Europe and into Asia Minor, dated back to 500 BC. So once I saw the trajectory of the history of the Celts. Um, I thought, wow. And I love, I developed a real passion for travel writing. Mm -hmm. And I was, and I could see how much I enjoyed and I was learning about history and geography and all kinds of things through the vehicle of travel writing. I, I innately, it wasn't like a conscious decision, but I thought, hmm, I think others do their traditional repertoire perhaps better than I do. And moreover, this whole a swath of Celtic history is extremely fascinating to me, and I'm really keen to go and learn about it. So uh, in in particularly leading up to the Mask in the Era 93, I had started in Spain, in the northwest corner in Galicia, and you can't open up the door of Spanish history in that Celtic corner without being confronted with the traditions that came and, and cultures that came with the Islamic, Christian, and Judaic communities. And you can't talk about the history of Spain without going to Morocco. <laughs> so I found myself traveling to these different places, uh, these places across Spain and into Morocco, often seeking guides, professional guides or educators to instruct me in what I was seeing and, and how to interpret it in a broader sense. I would read many things. I would watch films. I would absorb anything that I could about a period, a time and place. And then I would 
go home or go somewhere and let it percolate. And out of that uh, came this kind of mm, cultural fabric that I wanted to paint with different instruments and idioms. Mm -hmm. For those of our listeners who, when they hear the word Celtic or Celtic music, they really have this image of the ethnologists refer to them as the insular Celts, the, the Celts of the British Isles, and maybe spilling over into northern France, the Breton region. But it really is a gigantic geographical area that they encompass. And because there were so many different tribes who were really mm. joined by mostly the root language, the core language elements, it really is licensed for you to put together a musical smorgasbord that, that really yes, yes. Um, unites all kinds of, of influences, which I, I have to say you've done so seamlessly, so gracefully. Um, one thing that one never senses is, even though I'm, I may be listening to an Irish small pipe along with an oud or a lyra from you know the Islamic parts of the world, they feel like they belong together. They feel like mm -hmm. they are somehow in a family when you weave them into into a musical whole. Yes, and the great thing about the success of the visit in 1991. Uh, it then gave me the financial wherewithal to take things to another level. So not only was I starting to travel and research like travelers and researchers of old, uh, I, I would find myself uh, at a second home at Peter Gabriel's studio in Wiltshire in, in England at Real World Studios. And of course, Peter, uh, his Real World label and WOMAD, he's lived, uh, he's with all this multicultural influence and in musicians. So when we're there and I'd be working and I say, well, you know, I need a lira player. I need a, a you know, a table player, whatever it is. We just go to the office and say, who do you have? <laughs> who can we contact? <laughs> right. You know, we, we, we dialed up the wonderful, wonderful uh, group fretwork from London, this beautiful viol group uh, to come and play. So, that was so exciting to have the financial wherewithal to now start painting those arrangements in this kind of way. But I'm a very inexperienced and feel it as I go along kind of creator, producer. I don't go into the studio often with all the music written or the lyrics all written or, or fully conceived. It's nerve wracking to a degree, but I now understand that's that's the way I am or the way it's got to be. I do remember when we were working on the Book of Secrets in 97, the spring of 97, and I hadn't finished writing all the material, in, 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 including the, the Mummer's Dance. Mm -hmm. And the big room at Real World has some sub uh, rooms for isolation purposes all around the periphery of the big room. And I had tucked of my writing set up in one of these rooms. And I was working on some of the core elements of the mummer's dance. I said to Hugh Marsh, the wonderful violinist that I work with, to come in and just give me his feedback. And I said, I played a bit for him. And I said, Hugh, do you think I should keep working on this musical idea? And he said, yeah, no, I think you should keep working on it. <laughs> mm -hmm. it, it went on to be my biggest success uh, commercially anyway. Right, so, right. So anyway. The visit was, in fact, a kind of a breakout album for you. It was had, I think, uh, what about one point four, one point five million in sales, and presumably opened the door for more extensive touring, bigger mm -hmm. and better venues. You know, um, and of course, uh, record labels when they're distributing you and see good sales, then they want to invest more because they think they can take the next one to the next level and the next level. So I can see how being prepared to take that step of weaving the influences together, you know, was really not only a great musical formula, but also a great career move. Yes. I mean, I could see that I've, I've resisted creating for what I would call commercial purposes. Uh, I've tried to be true to whatever my creative idea is. But having said that, there's no question, and particularly once we started getting into Eastern Europe and some of the Greek and Turkish instruments and idioms that it they just hearing their 
musical instrument voices in an arrangement all of a sudden complete con really connected with them and so uh, i mean my my um career in turkey which is considerable i uh, got started actually in 1995 with a five piece uh, what do they call it? EP that was of Christmas songs, mm -hmm. uh, Good King Wenceslas and God Rest You Merry Gentlemen and so on. But I brought more of the Middle Eastern instruments and arrangements to those pieces, trying to bring the East back to Christmas. Right, right. And and I, I, I we got this call from the promoter of the Istanbul Jazz Festival saying we'd like you to come and do a concert. And I thought they had made a terrible mistake. And then when I investigated further, all these sales had happened because in the middle of July they were playing this five song EP of Christmas pieces up and down the street. <laughs> Isn't that something? So, That's amazing. But, but it does speak to that business that that situation of people. She, Although they couldn't understand the lyrics and they didn't necessarily know that these were what we would call in this part of the world Christmas carols, it was something that really spoke to them. One of the things that I really admire and love about your music making is that while you know you still are true enough to that Scottish Irish tradition of incorporating some really great dance numbers that really kick up the heels, you also have never fallen prey to sort of what, what I think of as a, a predisposition in pop and rock music, which is, you know, e emotion is equated to volume. You know, the louder it is, the more emotional it is. And you have always managed to, to recognize the emotional intensity of a whisper, of an intimate moment. And I think that in many ways, those for me are some of the highlights of your, of your albums. Um, is that something that, that you've given some conscious thought to? Uh, there's an inner quality and a stillness that I think is is very compelling in, in your music. I mean, when I think of that comment, I think actually going back to my childhood in Morden, Manitoba and working with that choir, that Olga Friesen's choir, and she was extraordinarily talented as a choir conductor. And our choir used to compete with the Winnipeg Mennonite Children Choir and come quite close but what I was introduced to at the age of five was dynamics and the the concept or the feeling of intimacy and the power of that, the power of of, of intimacy so through the dynamics of how she was shaping and conducting our choral music. Uh, sometimes even when we were doing recitations in the festivals as a as a class, we'd have mm -hmm. memorize a poem and the teacher would be saying, and now come down, right? And so I was raised, I, I was raised with this sensibility. So it wasn't something I had to intellectually figure out and calculately do. It, it was mm -hmm. something I was really raised with. <laughs> you you had it internalized it from an early era that that was yeah. just part of your 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 natural musical and emotional vocabulary. Yes, as a result of being exposed to these teachers. Mm -hmm. that were really creating, were performing, putting us as singers through through that. Another, you know, I think really distinctive feature in your work is your embrace of literary sources. I mean, in not in all, but in, in quite a few of your, your most successful songs, Tennyson and Yeats and Shakespeare and so on. I suppose there's a certain risk that people will think that, you know, you're awfully la-di-da and a bit on the highbrow side. But it, of course doesn't come across that way at all. Lady of Shalott is, you know, really a a wonderful romantic ballad when you come down to it. Um, how do you go about finding a text or deciding that a text speaks to you? What is it that makes you, I mean, there's obviously a, a certain romanticism in some of it, but you know, Shakespeare isn't exactly a romantic and Yeats is some way is a kind of a post-romantic. Where do you find your your moments of deciding to choose a text? Well, I think, you know, coming to the point of drawing upon some of the Dead Poets Society for lyrics is as much a, an act of um, necessity as it has been a, of desire from the standpoint. I've never really felt that my lyric writing was the strongest thing I did. And moreover, I, I, so I wanted to draw upon other authors whose works, well, first of all, met a kind of, uh, they had a strong imagery in, this, in the tale an aesthetic as well. So there's not just the, the tale, but the aesthetic of, of it all. 
of course, pr very practical things is like, are the words singable? And they can even, yeah, <laughs> and I, the phrase is kind of, you know, I think it goes back to your comment of the smorgasbord, mm -hmm. uh, of having this smorgasbord, this unpredictability of what people are going to experience and where it's going to come from. You know, with the Lady of Shalott, I, I, I chose that as a poem that had a tangential kind of Celtic connection. But I also think that those early years at the Festival Theatre, and then also in the 80s, I was working on some films at the National Film Board, that I came to appreciate and understand the uh, role of playing a supporting role to something else. So when I found any poems, I say, okay, I don't want to take them over. I want to find a way to find a musical complement to the lyrics that make it speak perhaps in a way or more widely than it does just a spoken word. Mm -hmm. uh, when I think of the highwayman, for example, how we, w I've got tapes and tapes and tapes of that, trying to track that down. And that studying, let's say, the, the, the rhythmic pattern of trying to emulate the, the motion of the horse, which we, we, we played that drum with, the, with um, a boron, which, which had this kind of lilt. But when the story comes along to the, the military coming into view, the rhythm squares away quite tightly to a military kind of rhythm. And so it, between the choice of things as well as how you, you it's all this trying to create the imagery mm -hmm. uh, of, of something. And, and with Shakespeare, you know, it's hard to find anyone more poignant and sophisticated as, as that. And having worked at the Stratford Festival Theatre, it's mm -hmm. very much in my blood. Right. Very much so. You are one of the three most celebrated Stratford associated musicians. I can say, yeah, I include Glenn Gould as one because he was the music director at the Stratford festival in the early sixties. And the third one, we don't need to mention. Uh, <laughs> I just passed his star on the street in front of the Avon today. <laughs> uh, yes, bless him. I, I believe you. Anyway, the branching off into live albums, that's something that's a kind of a different mm. process. And some of those have also resulted in extraordinary videos. For a plug, one of my favorites, mm -hmm. which is Nights of the Alhambra. What an extraordinary event it captures and what how beautifully produced. First of all, how hard is it to get in to actually do a live performance at the Alhambra? It's a world historic site and, you know, yeah. presumably you have to be very careful about lights and booms not bumping into things. Um, Tell me a little bit about that project. Yes. I mean, uh, Spain was the first international territory that really took off for me in 91. The visit was released in the fall of 91 in Canada and in some other international territories, including Spain. But by the spray, by this, well, January of 92, the record, that record had taken off so fast that we were able to do a 13 date tour, including the Palo de Musica in Barcelona. Spain has been a very strong territory from almost the get-go. So when when we're talking with WNET out of New York about perhaps putting together a performance for the Great Performances series, they're always looking for interesting locations as well as music. So I was able to, with, with my concert promoter in Spain, made the introduction to the people in Granada to, the, I flew over with the first director to Spain and to Granada and had lunch <laughs> with the folks and try to convince them that we would be very, very responsible with this UNESCO heritage site. And I mean, it was very nerve wracking because I hadn't actually done a concert myself as an artist since 98. Mm -hmm. uh, but also I would find myself as the executive producer of this event, never having produced a television project in my life before. So I was wearing two big hats. But anyway, the, 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 the Spanish people in Granada were very, very generous to give us the opportunity. The good news is we didn't, we didn't harm the place and they came to the performance and everybody went away quite happy. And the finished work, which uh, if um, memory serves, is kind of like a, a grouping of greatest hits from your albums up to that, up to that yeah. point. It really is a, an extraordinary way to be for people who are you know, wanting to be introduced to you for the first time, I highly recommend that as as a great entry point. Of course, you know, the other option, which I also recommend, is just buy them all in chronological order and get lost in them. 
I only take a small commission for my advertising services, by the way. <laughs> uh, one of the things about that, that that ties into what I would call another overarching element in your work is what I call a flavor of mysticism, which I think is very appealing in you know an increasingly materialistic and often cynical world that we live in. You know that joining together of you know, what I would say a Celtic appreciation of the earth and animal spirits, mm -hmm. and also a sense of of timelessness that there are attributes in your work that seem to reach back into time immemorial and yet still have a very contemporary flavor. You know, are these things that you that you consciously try to weave into your work or are they just sort of there in your in your psyche? I think both. I think both. I've used the history of the Celts as a as almost as a self-educational tool and I've been fascinated to bring forward elements of other cultures and other times and and see if they can be expressed with some contemporary relevance, perhaps. And uh, yeah, I, it's it, those are themes that I'm very interested in, and so it stands to follow that they would be expressed in my music for sure. Yeah. Along this this path of developing, sometimes it seems from the way you've described it, even spontaneously in the studio, a role for. Instruments that for you know the average, let's say, Western listener are going to be new and unfamiliar. Did you have any discoveries that, uh, oh my God, where's that instrument been all my life? What a what an extraordinary sound. I, I just have to keep using that. You know, I'm I'm gonna guess probably not the hurdy gurdy, because it's kind of a <laughs> an odd, an odd instrument, but I have to say, I think Certainly, one of the uh, of the instruments that would fall in this category is the lyra. I mean, it's mm -hmm. called a lyra in, in Greece, but it's called kamenchi in in Turkey. Or other, it's a smallish three string instrument. It almost sounds like it has the register of a cello. But the first time I heard it was in it was a, a cistern in Istanbul, and there was an oud and a kamenchi, and I think a little drum, and it was so haunting. It's not something you can use all the time or even most of the time, but there's something about that voice that for me is is really compelling. I I, I agree. I mean, if you see it, it's it's kind of like a little upright fiddle. Um, yes, but yes. But kind of like, uh, for, if people know the viola da gamba, you know, let's say someone sent it to the cleaner and it shrunk. So instead of holding it between your knees, you put it on your knee, you know? On your knee. <laughs> yes, but uh, you recorded... Uh, a live album at the Albert Hall, right? Yes, yes. We now that's that a years. gigantic barn of a place. What what was that? That must have had some special challenges to it. Five thousand seats. Well, yes, yes. I mean, it, it it it's it wasn't too too bad because we have. I work with some superb sound engineers, so they go in and they know. I mean, in our case, he had mixed in the Royal Albert Hall before, Rob Wade. And he knew what the problems or the challenges were and how to address them. Um, yeah, it was quite it was quite thrilling. I mean, my first exposure to the Royal Albert Hall was when I was a warm up act for Mike Oldfield in 1993. And uh, there's a you know whole other sub story for that so maybe in another broadcast. <laughs> uh, it was nice. It was nice to be able to come back in my own right into that venue. I mean, and see all the different kinds of things that are non-musical that it's been used for. So. Oh yeah, incredible. I mean, my visits there have always, you know, been connected with classical concerts and I've always thought, oh my God, the acoustics are really, like everyone thinks it's a good place, but it's just, it's kind of awful, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. But uh, I mean, it's just too big. Um, yes, but obviously yes. with with the right kind of control and a board and amplification managing some of the those challenges, it, it can be it can be quite workable. I think I think that's about the way to put it, because my own experience is when you have venues that have been designed for a multiple things, but nothing in particular, they don't really shine in anything in particular. They yeah. might be adequate. You know? Yeah. I, while I was preparing for this, made a little discovery, which was um, a phenomenon on YouTube called the first hearing videos, where all sorts of extraordinary YouTube personalities, some 
you know, with big followings, some with small followings, basically spontaneously react to some music for the first time. And there's this whole subcategory of first hearings of Lorena McKennett. And, you know, I, there were a couple of Irish, uh, Irish vocal coaches, uh, vocal coaches, you know, listening and just being absolutely blown away by your technique, which they say is absolutely distinctive and really, you know, one of a kind. And, you know, the the particular areas of how she uses her voice are extraordinary because they're so powerful without ever having to, like, she never overpowers her voice. She never, you know, so, and then there are these, these ultra young people with all kinds of piercings and they're listening to, to music and they're, you know, making the most extraordinary associations that I had, one video of a, a young woman from Africa who was discovering you for the first time. But what's really interesting is virtually all of these are very young people. They are mm -hmm. discovering you for the first time and they are just totally overwhelmed by what they're hearing. So I don't know whether what to make of that, except to say it's lovely to see how music that doesn't quite fit into the pigeonholes can actually reach across all kinds of barriers and find new audiences, unexpected audiences. Yeah, this brings to mind, you know, I've, I've often thought that the music industry hasn't really understood or appreciated the exceptional medium that they've been handling and sadly have reduced so much of it down to a fashion commodity. Music is such an extraordinary method of communication and I think it has so much more possibility and meaning in people's lives than what the infrastructure of the business side has 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 led us all to. Uh, I think there's been some positive sides of the the digital era, uh, allowing you know people to hear s s such a broad cross section of things. But mm -hmm. I mean, also you know, I could wane for a long time about the detrimental sides. No, I think it speaks to the fact that that music can be incredibly universal. And for me, probably one of the most important aspects of my relationship with the music that I create, in the Sufi world, they talk about polishing the mirror of your soul and that there's something transparent that is so directly connected from your, your own heartbeat to somebody else's heartbeat. And I know that as a performer, as an artist, I'm constantly working towards that end. Have Am I just being a technician and singing a song, or am I going across that barrier to a place which is where it, 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 you're, you're so much closer to someone else's soul? And for me, that's, that's a central part of what I try to do. And it, I think, is, is in many ways something that as music has become more and more commercialized and and has become more and more almost a formulaic synthetic product you know we lose the essence of music you keep to the essence of music you're always searching for that moment where one heart can beat in sympathy to another um, and find those moments and it's it's great to see that if you also strip out the other insidious element which is presumption pre prejudice and mm -hmm. categorization if you just basically say here's a piece of music you know i don't care what you think of it what you compare it to whether it fits into your idea of this thing or that thing just listen to it and yeah if it works it works well this was for me one of the the issues that i had to broker relatively early on particularly after the visit was released is that what bin do you, you know i remember ken slater back at sam the record well what bin should it does it go to the folk yes. the new age or, or what what part of it and and that you can be ghettoized and you can people can be uh, be steered away from something that in actual fact they might want i mean i remember it was so extreme that uh, I remember, I think it was once I got with Warner Brothers in the United States, and it was listed as a new as new age music. Well, I didn't want it listed as new age music. I felt that what I did was different than that. And I remember rating the head of Billboard because I was constantly, at, you know, a higher part of the new age chart. And I just said, I don't want to be on that chart. <laughs> put, yeah, put me somewhere else. <laughs> and I remember everybody scratching their heads saying, 
what? What is yeah, she doing? You're, Why is she doing that? Yeah, you're charting, darn it. I mean, you should be happy. You're charting, you know. And, and ultimately, well, this takes me back to, to what I was saying at the beginning. What you really needed was the Lorena chart because right. <laughs> or or and again, this is, you know, where we're being a shrewd business person. You say to Sam, well, I want to be in five different bins. So you're going to have to take five yeah. times as much product. Well, a number, of, a number of the smaller retails got got that in spades. And I remember one little shop in Tucson, Arizona, he had a listening post before anybody had listening posts. And you walked out buying Enya, he'd be saying, well, have you heard of Lorena McKenna and so on. And then another shop, I remember going in Atlanta because they had sold so many copies of the visit. And then Warner Rep had brought me around and I went into the shop and the owner said, I bet you come here to see how I do this. And I said, well, I have actually. He said, well, just go and stand in the corner. So I stood in the corner and, and he, a woman walked in. He put on the visit, but he didn't start at the beginning. He went straight to the Lady of Shalott for long 12 minutes. And all this, she browsed around. And then she went up to the corner counter and she said, what is that playing? And he said, well, it's an artist called Lorena McKenna and it's a piece called The Lady of Shalott. She said, oh, I really like that. Oh, I think I'll get a copy of that. And so she bought it and, you know, she laughed and he said, that's how, that's how we did it. So there were, there were, there were smaller retailers who had built all that wonderful fabric of relationship with their customer. And there's no question my career in those early days was built through a lot of those kind of relationships. It wasn't just the art itself, but it was also the people who were making these vital connections. And it is so much the the opportunity to have a chance encounter. I have a, a kind of a contrary story. I, uh, um, it was a, uh, a Tower Record, actually one of the biggest Tower Record stores, the uh, manager of the Tower Record classical department on Sunset Strip in Los Angeles. And he came up to me at a, at a conference and he said, I love such and such a record. And I said, why? He said, because it's so spiky. It was very contemporary avant-garde music. It's so spiky and awful that I that when it, I start to feel claustrophobic, I can scare people out of the department with it. <laughs> <laughs> What's worse is he said, I love to play it at Christmas time because I hate Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I said, uh, well, I choose to take that as a compliment. <laughs> and he said, believe it or not, I intend it as a compliment. You've made me, you've helped me keep my sanity. Anyway, um, bad story. Oh, Let's talk about technology because technology came up. We're not really supposed to talk about what happens in the jury room, but technology came up as quite an interesting subset of our conversations in the jury. And you have, I would say, a very interesting relationship as an artist and as an artist entrepreneur with what technology has done to the livelihood and the opportunities of the artist. Now, on the other hand, I think you'll, you would have to also concede that the kind of technology that you encounter in the creative process at places like Real World Studio has been an absolute gift to the artist. However, it is a, uh, one of those knives with two edges. What what kinds of things have you experienced? Because I did a podcast with um, a wonderful writer, Cory Doctorow, um, not so long ago, oh, yes, and he's yes, yes. yes, and he's basically written about the monopolistic abuses of technology and how it has impinged on the ability of artists to be creative and also to to make a livelihood. Would you like to, to comment on some of that? Oh. Uh, you can get the big hook when I go on to <laughs> now go ahead. Well, I think you know I do, I do you know I've, I've I've I think because I've built and run my own little business all these years, it's given me a, a, a real intimacy with with what's happened here. You know, I think there are different lenses to look through with respect to technology. There's the lens of the consumer, and there's a lens from the artist. Now. Through the artists, with for sure, technology has afforded many artists so many different uh, uh, ex exploratory paths and possibilities, which is pretty exciting sometimes. But the consumer, so much has been sold to the consumer on the basis of convenience and efficiency and cost and, and so on. And the consumer wouldn't necessarily know the business model 
that the a lot of these companies have been subjecting society to. <laughs> they kind of lured them to believe that everything was free. Uh, I mean, I think for me, one of the biggest shocking moments came when I was confronted with a BitTorrent site, not not long after the Napster window, and this BitTorrent site, which whose business model was frankly just getting eyeballs to the site, and they were selling the real estate around the the outer edges of the website to generate money. And this BitTorrent site was uh, facilitating the consumption, as it were, of every title that I had, including the videos. And it had a little counter at the bottom, and it was bragging that it it had facilitated people taking this music and this experience at the, I think it was like 5,000 units a week or something. So if you multiply that times the weeks of the year and the years and other sites like it, it was a catastrophic event that, that the regulation, just simply the technology had come into society, particularly in our industry, our industry was the, one of the first to be hit so hard that the legislators uh, just didn't know, nobody knew what was happening until it was very, very late. I know that the Spotify camp came in and saying, hey, we can save this for everybody. But in actual fact, it wasn't. Was it? Is it better? I'm not sure. Because just to give you, you or your listeners a sample, but when, when we would sell a CD or a vinyl or cassette, uh, as an artist, I would be paid about 25 cents per song in a streaming model now, and I know that, that that it's evolved a little bit, but it just gives a point of reference. In Spotify, artists might get paid 10 cents per thousand plays. Or on YouTube, which is a Google uh, product, I might get paid 0. 0.00013 cents per play. So you now have to enter in the multiple millions to make the revenue that you did before. And you just simply can't. And because there's so many other artists now in the landscape, everybody's competing for the same 24 hours that we have in each day. So to you know, cut to the chase of it, there are, have been two sides of the music industry. There's the music production, and you commodify it, and you sell it, and you make money that way. And then there's the touring side. And it used to be up until 98, we would sometimes run our tours as a lost leader because the sales of the recordings would be so strong. We'd look at sound scan reports and we could see this long tail of sales across the catalog once we left town. The first side of music is now broken. And so people have had to primarily revert or resort to touring and performances to sustain themselves. And that pie, the revenue, I've forgotten what the figures are of the industry prior, like 97 or 96 to what it became a mere 10 years later. It was, it was, it was this huge collapse of this pie. So the pie is much short, smaller, and you have still most artists, not myself, because I manage my own, and I own my own masters, right. et cetera, but most other artists are signed to a record company, have a manager, and there simply was not enough money left to pay everybody. So very, very accomplished artists who deserve to have their careers go on still could not make it financially worth it. And we've seen, it's a bit like Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. Mm -hmm. I feel I'm seeing not only artists who should, who should be out there still like myself, um, but I, I see a disappearance of music in the schools because the tech has taken over and has made it STEM, not STEAM. I ran into a child uh, in just Blythe, Ontario, about a month or so ago, who's in grade four, and she shared with me she had never sung at all at school yet. So, uh, so I see that the invasion of this invasive species of unregulated technology broke our industry in a way that until there's much more regulation, I don't see that coming back. And I think just to fi finish with that thought, it has been, sadly, the, dis the fact that that part of the business model is so horribly broken. Now we find there's no longer a business case argument to be making a lot of new material with all those exotic in instruments. It's extremely expensive, not unlike symphony orchestras are.
It's terrible. And and you're right that your situation, as difficult as it, is, it must be, is still privileged compared to those who are, who are, you know, if you're the record label and you own the master and you are, you know, have a huge catalog, so you've got a mass of material. And in, in this business model, it's simply the amount of material, the number of, of titles that you have, then you could potentially, in aggregate, generate a good amount of revenue, perhaps. That's one reason why the record labels actually own part of Spotify. So they exactly. get it coming and going. But exactly. if you're the artist and you're getting, let's say, a 10 or a 12% royalty, then you're getting 10% of a thousandth of a cent per play, uh, which is beyond ridiculous. Yes. It's, it's, it's just absurd. not sustainable. And I think, if, I, I mean, again, I appeared before the Heritage Committee back was when we were trying to ratify the copyright re reform and and spoke about how many artists live below the poverty line. And I think many people in the public do not realize this. Not me, I'm fine. So not I'm not talking about, I'm speaking on behalf of my other artistic colleagues who deserve so much better, but because the business model was not protected with legislation, but rather had these predatory tech companies come in and exert their their break it fast and run <laughs> mode of business. It's, it's just too bad, really. Is there any kind of an upside, for example, that it's easy for people to discover you because they might not have, they were only discovering you with old fashioned radio, for example, um, there is at least an ability to find new listeners. Um, did, have you seen any, any evidence of that? Yes. I mean, there, there's, it's, it's very difficult to quantify because really the only way that we used to be able to quantify people, the awareness and their commitment to the music, of course, is when they buy something, you know, if you're measuring millions of, of, of plays on Spotify or something. It's a very, very impersonal and detached experience. Yeah. I was hearing someone this morning, an analyst in the music industry, saying how it's all become about the song, whereas it used to be about the artist. Well, and there's there's one other thing that I, I really lament, which is the the real loss of the concept of the album as an artistic artifact. You know, these, you know, I mean, I talk to friends and they don't have CD players. I want to give them a CD. They say, oh, well, what am I going to do with that thing? But the, the, the fact is that because the Spotify world is a mix and match collection of individual songs, often chosen for you by an algorithm that thinks it knows what you're going to like yeah. better than you know yourself. Yeah. Um, the idea that you know something that has been crafted as a journey with a beginning, a middle, and an end, a rhythm, a certain sequence of emotions and ideas that takes you from a, a the beginning a, to a to a conclusion, mm -hmm. all of that is kind of gone and replaced by a sort of a randomness. A randomness and an impersonal kind of experience, which is very singular and in a kind of bubble type of way, but you don't have a relationship. Uh, you, you just, it's right. impossible to have a relationship with the material where you're studying, well, oh, that was recorded at Real World or Metalworks or wherever and was produced by this person that you, you used to be able to follow along. And I don't think this is simply being sort of romantic or something. I think it speaks to real human need of being known and being recognized. But I think all of that, the value of that kind of human experience has been served up on the altar of convenience and cheap things, you know, things that are inexpensive. Right. And that's back to that consumer lens. I think the consumer feels they're doing just okay, thanks very much. But it's not helpful or, or good or sustainable if, if everybody in the equation isn't able to have equity and, and a balance in this. Well, I agree. I mean, there is a, a fundamental justice issue. There's also a fundamental, this is is an ecosystem that will collapse because it can't be sustained. I mean, you know, this is a field that relies on creative new material that is generated by people, by human beings with inspiration and needs, and also the need to pay their rent and, and buy groceries. And if people are driven out of that field, then ultimately it is going to stagnate 
and collapse. You know, and the it's an exploitation that is based on the fact that you know the people who are in it are in it not only for the money, but be also for dedication, love, and inner need mm. to express. So it keeps them there longer than the business case would would normally indicate. They stay yes, longer. Yes. They suffer through more. They put up with more. Absolutely. But eventually, they don't want to live under a bridge, so no. they you know end up getting a job in sales. You know, no. Um, there's been a whole middle class of artists that have disappeared. You know, it's it's either the very very top, the Taylor Swifts and Justin Bieber's type of thing. Or there's a, a more impoverished, lower classes that were very, very accomplished artists in their own right, for sure. But usually people with that before they have families, but they're really, really struggling to make a living. And, and which, of course, now we're at the doorstep of chatbots. And I think we're now entering something, what I call a digital pandemic, I think. <laughs> yes, it's uh well, boy, we're, we we sure took a turn of, for the apocalyptic. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's 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 go. be cheerful. Absolutely. Let's talk about let's talk about how hopefully there still is life in in live performance and yeah. touring with yeah. the people who love you and the and the ability to construct new material with the well. First of all, there is touring with merch, so there is still a place for the album because people buy albums. At concerts, you know, yes. I don't know what they play them on, but they do. They do buy them. Um, yeah, we're finding people may have a, still be driving a vintage of vehicle that they have CD players in. So we we surprisingly have continued to sell a respectable number of of um, CDs. But there's no question that vinyl is in a on a rising position. And I and I can't help but think that, that you know, going back to where we just come from is that people are now, they've kind of exhausted the digital, impersonal, isolating experience, and they want to get back to something that's tangible and analog and that there's a richness of what was involved in making this music. Um, right. So, yeah, I, 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 we're, we're seeing great success in the vinyl, relatively speaking. That is uh, very encouraging. And of course, you know, having started a record label that only ever made CDs, you know, I always said, you know, I, my partner was an engineer and he, you know, had some real issues with vinyl. And, you know, I know you've worked with the legendary Bob Ludwig, who clearly like the grand master, the <laughs> mystic, you know, ab ability to coax things out of a, a plastic surface that, you know, shouldn't be possible and all the rest of it. But I love the, just the physical object of, a, of, a, of an album. The, the fact that your cover art actually is big enough to actually look like a piece of artwork rather than, you know, something that you have to strain to read, especially when you get to my age. So touring is is continuing. Is there a case for for developing new whole programs with touring primarily in mind? Um, to the degree that I, I'm I'm understanding, I mean we we we're just about to launch a whole series of 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 dates, but we're we're actually branding the falls tour as we did last fall as a visit revisited. Um, mm -hmm. And then next spring we'll be in Europe doing the same, uh, but then we're back in Europe next summer doing a probably a branding of the mask and beer. Um, oh, okay. that, we're, that we're finding that people that people seem to, on one hand, you know, if you don't have something really brand new, to be able to go back to something where they can say, oh yes, I remember when it, where I was and what I was doing and. I was just dating someone or we got married or whatever it was. And then it's a, it's an ability to kind of go back into a period of time. So that's, that's something we're doing at the moment. I have to say, and I was just thinking about this morning, about five years ago, I took a fabulous trip to Rajasthan to research material for another recording. And it's so rich. I feel like I've got this tickle chunk full of all these ideas. <laughs> well, that's uh, that's what I'm trying to. I'm coaxing you. I'm saying, you know, there's new albums in you yet, even oh. if they start oh. off as oh. as as tour first, album second. You yeah, know? yeah. Well, I mean, usually, yeah, it's it's not something I I really thought much of. I was coming up with new p material and putting it out there the first thing on a tour without having recorded it. Often I find for myself that recording is a discipline. You kind of sort yourself out as to what a piece is. 
or what it could be. But it's not to say that, you know, there couldn't be something really quite interesting, exceptional by doing it the other way around. And who knows, you know, maybe that's the only way something truly, really new, um, we could do it. It's just that it's very expensive bringing out many more than five or six musicians. I know that with an ancient music, yeah. I think we brought out about nine. I think we were four buses and two semi-trailers and... It, yes. It's very, very expensive. So then, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and those economies now, especially with things like fuel yeah. and shipping, those things have gotten really, really crazy. So, yeah. um, but anyway, long may you continue to create, to journey, to adventure, um, mm. to reach into the world of the mystic and into the human heart, because it has been an incredible trip and uh yeah. someone who has been a listener of your work for a long time it's meant a lot to me and i know it has for for millions of people around the world lorena so thank you so much for joining us it's been a real pleasure brian we'll get through we'll get through these technological oh yes hiccups somehow yeah we will indeed yeah thanks so very much brian it's been a real pleasure thank you Foundation is a registered Canadian charity and we rely on the support of arts lovers like you to continue bringing inspiring stories to life. Please consider giving by visiting our website glengould.ca. And if you're interested in keeping up with the Gould Standard podcast and more work from the Foundation, be sure to follow us across social media on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook at the Glen Gould Foundation. On the yellow field beside remote Shalad. She left the grave, she left the law. She made three paces through the ground. She saw the water lily bloom. She saw the hell.